Good afternoon, everyone. Please take your seats. My name is Oleg Kirita. I'm the head of the ICMPD's Global Initiatives, and I warmly welcome you to this side event, Mobility and the Green Transition. The last year's edition of the Vienna Migration Conference put climate change and migration in the spotlight. The session devoted to this topic concluded that there is a need to acknowledge that the climate-fueled migration is inevitable and that it represents a developmental and economic challenge beyond a humanitarian one. Consequently, the session suggested a number of solutions to address this, including legal pathways and innovative migration partnerships, combining education, training and jobs that are of paramount importance. Climate change is a major driver of a green transition. The need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and mitigate the impact of climate change is prompting governments and businesses all over the world to invest in green technologies, practices and skills. The transition to green economies is a global priority. For instance, the European Green Deal adopted in 2019 is the EU's new strategy to promote sustainable and inclusive growth that can be achieved, among many other things, through skills development and global partnerships. The subsequent EU skills agenda and the new Pact on Migration and Asylum highlight the salience of migration for the EU's green transition. And also this morning, the Vice President Skinas mentioned the fact that the Korean transition was included in the recently signed agreement of Tunisia. Now, when you look at the African Union strategy, the Africa we want 2063, we can see that Africa puts a very strong emphasis on the transition to green economies, speaking actually of a skills revolution with the aim to building knowledge, human capital, capabilities and skills. It goes without saying that one of the common denominators of these political objectives is investments in skills across the entire spectrum and across all sectors of the economy. It is against the, this backdrop, as well as within the context of the European years of skills, that we are very pleased to organize this side event that intends to analyze the interplay between the green transition and human mobility. In particular, we would like to find out how could the green transition benefit from human mobility in terms of further investment in human capital and job creations in partner countries as well as across the European Union. And what role for governments, businesses, entrepreneurs or other relevant actors such as diasporas. In ICMPD, we paid increased attention to the topic by investing in research, capacity development and legal pathways. In this respect, the MIU initiative has produced the report Human Capital and Mobility at the Service of the Green Economy, while the EU Global Diaspora Facility has published the policy piece mobilizing the diaspora for the green transition. Finally, the Migration Partnership Facility, or MPF, supports a number of mobility partnerships within the green transition context that will be presented today by the two speakers invited to this side event. It is, for, it is very for high time now to introduce you our distinguished panelists. I'm very thrilled and delighted to have you today by my side. You have two different professional backgrounds, but more importantly, you are already working in the field of harnessing and identifying solutions to connect the green transition and human mobility. On my left, I have the pleasure to introduce you Dr. Rafaela Greco Toneguti, who is the team leader in migration and development at the Belgian development agency known as Enabel, where she focuses on labor migration, diaspora engagement, forced displacement or inclusion. And on my right, my, my pleasure is to introduce you uh, Dr. Diderik de Boer, who is director of international projects and consultancies department and associate professor sustainable business development at the Maastricht School 
of management. First of all, thank you so very much for joining us today. I also kindly invite the online audience to raise their questions, comments, or suggestions in the online chat that is available to you. Now, let's put certain things into a certain perspective, and I would like to, to start off with you. We know that globally, the transition to uh, green economies and actions to limit greenhouse gas emissions could create, according to the International Labour Organization, 24 million jobs by 2030. Other estimates are even much higher. So, co considering all these facts and figures, it goes without saying that skills, investment and development are decisive factors enabling the green transition in the first place. Could you please share with us a bit of analysis on the impact and magnitude of the green transition on labor markets and skill systems? And what are the challenges and opportunities that the world is current, currently facing when it comes to the green transition? All right, thank you very much, uh, Oleg. Um, Indeed, the challenge is if we're talking about the, uh, the green economy and, uh, and the cry for skills is, is, is enormous, um, both in the global south as in, uh, in the north. However, the, um, uh, the cry and, and, and the need and the demand for, for, for these skills differ per, per economy. So stronger economies do require also a little bit different skills. And to put that into perspective, I would like to um, take you with, uh, with you to, to my home country, the Netherlands. Uh, if we look there at the statistics um, in terms of vacancies, and we hear that also saying before, there is, uh, we have about 400,000 vacancies uh, in the Netherlands. And of these 400,000 vacancies, 100,000 are related to the green economy. Uh, that's about 25%. Um, and that number uh, is, uh, is also increasing now uh, over time. And if we're talking about these 100,000, then also diving a little bit deeper into that, then you see also that re re related to the, um, to the um, uh, digitalization transition, that there's a need for, for ICT personnel, there's a need for technicians related to the green economy, and there is a need for, for, for managers specialized in, in these fields. Well, how do we overcome that uh, in, in, in the Netherlands? Huh? We try to see to what extent we can uh, give more attention to uh, students uh, uh, focusing on beta studies. We're trying to get more people from, uh, from different uh, professions into this field of the, the green economy. Um, but so far, it's, it, it's very hard, and, and, we're, uh, and we're facing many challenges. In, in, in doing so, and moreover, it's uh, also, uh, we're part of an aging population, what we hear before. So on top of that, it's very hard to fill these jobs. Like we heard also with the previous speaker, that means also that, that our economy is, um, is, is hampered by the fact that we do not have enough skilled workers to, to provide for these green economic jobs. So that is the case in the Netherlands. On the other hand, eh, we're working also in Africa, and also there there is a cry for, um, for skilled labor. But there we see that um, they lack, of course, m more the financing to invest in the green economy. They lack the educational programs to invest in it, and they lack also good policies. But you could also say, like um, uh, Mr. Chivas told us this morning, well, then we should look and see to what extent we can provide matchmaking, as unemployment rates in Africa are much higher in the weaker economies than, for example, in the Netherlands, in Europe. So uh, is, is that a possibility? And I think I would like to take out one uh, program which could provide us um, with, uh, with advantages of making use of, of legal pathways within the framework of, of, of migration, which might work and contribute also to, to, the, to the cry of the business community to get more skilled labor, which is not available in the Netherlands, which is hardly available in other parts of Europe, and which might be a way out. Uh, not, uh, well, it's about matchmaking, but also trying to build capacities finally in the partner countries, and we call this circular migration. And that is also what we're testing at the moment, um, together with the Ministry of Justice, together with the partner countries. Um, we're trying to get uh, students from, um, from abroad for uh, 
period of time to the Netherlands in the green economy, and in this case it's the horticultural sector, uh, work there for a period of time and then going back again to these, uh, to these partner countries. And I feel that this is a, a great tool which we should try to explore as the European Union much more in, in the future as it's on the one side more realistic uh, in the sense that it's, it's not getting migrant workers for, for good uh, going to Europe and on the other hand it still serves uh, the, the cry for, for skilled labor in the green economy in, uh, in Europe. And finally, it also then contributes on top of that, when people are going back, the capacities uh, needed in the partner countries. Thank you. We'll get back uh, in a second to uh, this type of scheme. Now I'm turning to you uh, to um, raise basically a question from a development perspective simply because you represent the development agency of, of Belgium. Uh, very recently, your minister announced at the UN Summit for, on Social uh, Development Goals uh, at the UN General Assembly that Belgium will continue investing in skills globally by providing support and technical assistance to its partner countries all over the world. Uh, for, from precisely from this political commitment and also a very uh, operational angle, of the uh, way how Annabel engages uh, with its partners uh, gl globally. Why it is important to focus on skills development, also to echo um, Dr. De Boer's perspective, including for the acceleration of the green transition, and to what extent can we rely on migrants or diasporas, but also how migration as a process could support that at large? Thank you very much, Oleg, and thank you for having me, a development actor, at this important conference. So I feel the responsibility to bring in this perspective because we also have to bear in mind that when we talk about partnership, we are talking about multiple actors and multiple perspectives and diverse perspectives. So please keep these words in mind while I answer, in, if, and if I'm not satisfactory, <laughs> please get back, because this is crucial, and I don't think we've heard enough of this up until now. So why is this nexus between human mobility and climate change so important also with a development hat? Uh, and from a development perspective. Many people think when you, when you hear these two concepts together in the development uh, uh, arena, in the development world, you immediately think of uh, uh, displacement that is induced by natural disaster or the pressure over natural resources that comes after mass displacement due to conflicts, for instance. This is all true and this is very important and we will get back to that because also to that we need to find solutions and answers, but there are other dimensions. There are dimensions where mobility and adverse effect of uh, climate change and needs for a green transition, need to identify mitigation and adaptation solution, find an area of common interest between and among states. And there is really skills, and that's why for Belgium and us as a development actors are really focusing on skills. What does it mean to focus on skill? And now I'd like to challenge a bit what our Vice President Skinner said beforehand. When we talk about matching a need in the labor market and a talent that is somewhere in the world, it's not an easy operation. A talent doesn't grow by itself on a tree or on a plant. So in order to make sure that a match will eventually happen, there is an enormous investment in skills, and investing in skills means investing in systems, because in order to have skills available for the labor market, we need to have systems in place that respond to the need of the labor market in the first place of the country where we are talking about and also able to respond to needs of the region and globally. I hear very much what Janina said in the last panel, in order to have this mobility, you need to have several dimensions addressed and skills remain at the core and the very first investment. So I know I don't have to take much time, but when we talk about skills and mobility, I'd like to bring to your attention for the green transition and beyond five dimensions that I think we should bear in mind. One is what we've heard 
labor mobility. And as said, in order for labor mobility to, to take place, there needs to be structure, there needs to be policy framework. You hear what Janina said, you can identify a talent but that has the right skill, but there are still um, many hots and ardos that uh, can be in place. And you hear what I'm saying, in order to have skills available, you need to have systems in place that make sure that those skills are available. We can get back to that. So labor mobility as an answer. Circular mobility, we've heard. Cir circulation is certainly another key of ideas, of technologies, of investments, of people. Do not only think of those who work in agriculture for a seasonal period, also think of those who have great idea to solve the desalinization uh, issues for water in Senegal or in Burkina, and that needs to find investors in their ideas, in their technologies, that needs to find businesses, that needs to find partners who are willing to match with their ideas, we don't only match vacancies and talents, we also match ideas and investments with good ideas. And in order for this to happen, you don't just need to have ideas circulating, you also need to have people circulating and meet and discuss and match. Third, we have heard a lot today the word reintegration. What we didn't hear enough is how to make sure that when people go back to their country of origin or countries of previous residents, they bring the right skills for them to make the difference where there will be and for them to gain in uh, capacities and opportunities where they will be back and eventually somewhere else in case there is a regular and safe remigration. Fourth, I started by saying that when we connect climate change and human mobility, we often think of natural disaster or mass displacement after conflicts, for instance, and great pressure over land and resources. In those cases, solutions to mitigate the effect and to make sure that resources are actually available because those lands and territories are now inhabited by more people, they are absolutely essential, but also make sure that we harness at the maximum potential the talents of those, for instance, who are displaced or refugees in European countries and that have talents that can serve the green transition. And last but certainly not least, what you mentioned, Oleg, harnessing the potential and the role of diasporas, of their knowledge, mm. but most of all of their transnational connections that can make sure that these ideas, solutions and technologies can travel along with people. Thank you very much. Um, we will get back to, to the concept of partnership and its importance for the green transition, but also to make a bit of publicity, since you mentioned diaspora, which is very also close to, to my area of interest. Next week, uh, the EU Global Diaspora Facility, uh, which is implemented by us and funded by DG and by European Commission, will organize in Brussels the Future Forum. We will try to indeed look at the full potential of diaspora, including for, for the green transition. So please, if you're interested, uh, let me know. Indeed, the previous speakers, including in the previous panel, on the future of uh, work. Of work. Uh, the word policy was mentioned a couple of times. Mm -hmm. We all understand the importance of, uh, of policy making. But we have also seen in the last decade that in a number of countries all over the world, for example, in the Philippines, the government adopted uh, a Green Job Act. Uh, in uh, Colombia, a green uh, growth policy was established. Where, um, Rwanda uh, adopted uh, a climate resilience and green growth national strategy. Also, many of these policies, uh, and we analyzed them in the uh, MIU report that I announced at the beginning of this session, we see that many governments also look at migration as a solution to invest in skills and basically to uh, transit towards a greener economy. So, speaking now about policies, what will be your perspective, in particular when it comes to the partner countries beyond Europe in relation to um, flexibility of policies that they would need to further elaborate or establish so that an element of adapti adapt adaptability and flexibility of, of the labor market, and now we also mentioned uh, skill systems, could be fully integrated. Yeah, so in speaking about policies, if we analyze the policies there, uh, we, we look at it as from three different layers in a way, environment, societ societal policies, and more economical uh, policies. 
So if we're looking at the, the environment itself, then, then, then we see there that people are, are, are looking for, for a, level of, a level playing fields. If we're talking about the green economy, if we're talking about Europe gap, if we're talk, uh, we, we would like to see to what extent uh, the, the environment and, and, and the Green Deal and the policies related to that can be valid for, for, for European businesses as well as for, for global businesses. So to get alignment there will be very important. The second aspect is of course also then relates to, to society. So how do we now get society on board? How, how can we get commitment from society uh, for, 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 for the Green Deal, for, for the green economy? So one of the things relates then to role play. I think we cannot stress enough that role plays are very important, either we are in the global south or in the global north. I'm from the Faculty of Business and Economics in, uh, in, in, in Maastricht at the Maastricht University, and we're now thinking to see to what extent even for our business and economic students we should maybe have already a subject, a course on, on um, energy transition, just to get the message across. The, f the third part relates then uh, in terms of policies to the, to the economical layer. So uh, there we, we also would like, and that's what we hear from the business community as well, we would like to get an equal level playing field. Retailers, uh, producers should sit together in order to, um, to get this level playing field both in, the, in, in Europe as well as in, in the global south. Because, I mean, it's so important that people are saying, well, yes, we are willing to work on this Green Deal, but then at least, I mean, the rules of the game should be the same for everybody. Should, we should invest in that as, as, as much as possible. And finally, it's of course about policies related to, to matchmaking, operational and legal pathways. So how can we create then ecosystems, both in Europe as well as in, in the global south, in which we get the businesses, the government, and, and, the, um, and the universities or vocational training centers sitting together to, to adhere to the, to the advanced skills requirements uh, which are there. And we need to do this both in, uh, in the partner countries as well as in, the, um, well, as well as in, in, in Europe itself. I think that's some of the lessons learned we, we have so far. Thank you. You have just mentioned about this ecosystem um, between the um, between different actors, including the, the uh, private sector. So I'm turning to you uh, to get your perspective, in particular, on small and medium enterprises, uh, because they are particularly important in the context of the green transition. Uh, we also know that uh, they create between 70 and 80 percent of jobs in the world. But at the same time, we face the largest gaps in financing the transition towards the green economy, including in investing and, uh, uh, and reskilling and upskilling. We know that you have a lot of interesting experiences in engaging with the private sector in different countries, in particular in Africa. So I would like indeed now to learn from these experiences of, of yours and Annabelle. And maybe to be more precise, the question would be what type of business models and approaches uh, shall um, small and medium enterprises embrace and how does the business factor human mobility in their strategies? Very complex question. I'll try to answer to some bits and pieces. I don't have pretension of being comprehensive here, but I think that we've heard in the previous panel Janina saying that only big corporations, only big players have the capacity to actually have people move. Mm -hmm. Then we hear you speaking and you hear that more than 70% of the jobs are created by, by small and medium enterprises that don't have the capacity to see a talent on the other side of the world and make all the moves that are needed to have the training, the employability, the employment, and the mobility <laughs> components together so the magic happens and the matching easily become a reality as we have heard this morning. So we have a problem here. We, per we have a problem because we know that SMEs, including in our partner countries, they move the economy. They are having an hard time to transition to these green jobs, to the green, 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 as they are asked to and as they need to. And they also face a lack of talents because there is not enough investments in the 
competencies of people that will respond to the needs of these SMEs, not just in the Netherlands, in Belgium or in Austria, but also, as said, in countries like Senegal, Burkina or Morocco or Tunisia. So investing in skills and talents also means to listen very carefully to what are the needs of small and medium enterprises that are those who cannot afford by themselves the price of looking for talent here and there and having, I heard Janina very well, a hundred employees only working on the visa procedures for these talents traveling mm, yeah. around. One company, a hundred people only. That's SMEs certainly don't have this capacity at the same time. SMEs are where the innovation happens. SMEs are the hub for identifying, creating, testing, mm. and implementing solutions to some uh, mitigation solution, adaptation solution to some of the adverse effect to climate change. Therefore, and to cut a long story short, but we could could uh, keep talking about this much, much longer. As development agency, what is our mandate and our goal, and where do we intersect with this conversation? We have the power to connect, to connect interest and to connect a diversity of actors, and to find the area of interest that are common among actors, private sector and SMEs, here and there, north and south, south and south, and make sure that their, their interests and needs in terms of skills, in terms of talent, in terms of investment, and in terms of movement and mobility, also meet local needs in the countries where we work, and eventually also the willingness of people to move and, or to have their ideas moving. And I like to be concrete because, as Oleg said, I come from an operational perspective. I am an operator in the development field. So let me take my hat as an operator. Three very concrete examples where, as Belgium and as Belgian development actor, we've implemented ideas and we are supporting ideas of the private sector. One, and I hope we'll have a bit more time to go in depth later, is this project on entrepreneurial mobility that allows the matching of ideas and fostering the investment in good ideas for the desalinization in Senegal that I like very much, you must have understood, and others, uh, and to tap into the potential of diaspora entrepreneurship, not just in Belgium and in Europe, but across the West African region. So this is a business model and an approach. Tap on what entrepreneurs can propose and make sure that the matching of ideas and investment and, and people and talents can happen through mobility. Another is support climate smart and resilient agriculture ideas that are developed both in some of our partner countries, and let's take a uh, uh, a less easy country to work, when, uh, to work in these days, like Niger, Niger uh, and other countries, for, instan for instance, in Europe, and make sure that those who voluntarily return to Niger bring with them the capacity to implement this uh, climate-smart and uh, resilient agricultural technique in areas that are suffering from adverse effects of climate change. Very interesting outcomes that we can discuss. Third model that I wanted to discuss is investing in green jobs in countries that are themselves investing very much in the green transition, transition like it is the case in Morocco, for instance. We've heard uh, from you that many Af African countries, they are developing their own plans, their own idea ideas to address this issue, so to support this transition in areas that are like solar, like wind, etc., that, that are um, developing fast in these countries, and making sure that third country national led businesses, for instance, Senegalese led businesses in Morocco or Ivorian led businesses in Morocco can tap into the potential of what Belgium is supporting in Morocco in terms of green transition and bring it to the countries of origin. 
Why so? Because we know that some countries, like Morocco, have invested very much in South-South cooperation, so there are plenty of engineers that are being trained in Morocco and they're coming from Senegal or from Côte d'Ivoire or, or others that, that have a great playground in Morocco to test innovative ideas that can be scaled up or implemented in the countries of origin and we can support this. So here I gave you three very concrete business models and examples. Thank you very much. We still have 15 minutes to go and before uh, I open the floor to the audiences, uh, let me um, ask you one more question. So by now we have managed to tackle the what, the why and the who, the green transition and uh, its uh, connection with uh, human mobility. Now let's look at the how. Um, both your organizations, and we're very grateful to you for that, implement projects co-funded by the Migration Partnership Facility, MPF, which is funded by uh, a DG Home of European Commission. Could you please explain uh, to the audience why you de decided to uh, implement this project? What's the rationale behind? What you plan to achieve? And how indeed you can fully harness or to demonstrate that uh, the, the connection, the nexus between a green transition and human mobility is possible in very concrete terms? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, our project is called um, Harm, uh, Mobilize. And this project started by um, by working with the horticulture sector. We are from the Netherlands, so uh, this is a very strong economic sector in the Netherlands, and they're facing a lot of skills problems. And at the same time, uh, as, as Maastricht, we, were, we worked also a lot in, in Northern Africa, and we hear there that there, there are uh, possibilities of, of, of training skilled workers to be working in the Netherlands. But we had to work to do that in, in, in an existing framework. Um, so what we did actually is, and that's what we're going to pilot, and that's what we discussed also with the different ministries in the Netherlands, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Social Affairs, Agriculture and Foreign Affairs, to see to what extent we can uh, team up with, uh, with vocational training centers in Tunisia, Egypt and uh, Ethiopia, and to see if bachelor students could come to the Netherlands uh, on a three-month sh Schengen visa uh, to be trained first in, in their home countries uh, through capacity building. So uh, try to, to, um, to, to develop further the curriculum in these, these partner countries up to the level which is required by the businesses in the Netherlands. After that, they go to the Netherlands for a period of three, uh, three months, in which part is, 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 is at, the, um, at, at the training institutions, and, but uh, a majority of their time is also devoted then to, to, to learning on the job in the, in the greenhouses uh, in the Netherlands. Um, so, and we try to do this for about uh, 120 uh, um, uh, participants over a period of three years' time. And at the same time, and that is, I think, also equally important, we try to pilot this and to see to what extent it is possible to scale it up and to deal with this in other sectors which do have these demands. Meaning that we are building up um, ecosystems in the Netherlands itself, in which also the ministries play a role. So do we need to uh, look into uh, legal pathways which can, be, can go beyond the three months period of time? Uh, can we uh, find other ways of, of getting this circular mo mobility uh, in place? On the other hand, we have in these partners countries also these ecosystems in place. So when uh, the students and the workers are returning to, uh, to Tunis, Egypt or Ethiopia, they have the possibility either to, uh, to work in the horticulture sector itself as a worker, but we also create an ecosystem in which they can start their own business itself in these countries, so trying also to build some capacities in the horticultural sector itself in these countries. So then over time, we're trying to see to what extent, uh, well, these, these, these programs are becoming uh, successful, but so far we're, guide, uh, we're quite pleased that uh, all uh, the faces of the ministries, both in the Netherlands as well as in uh, the partner countries, both the faces of the businesses, both in the Netherlands as well as in the partner countries, as well as the, the, the universities and the vocational training centers, both in the Netherlands and the partner countries, are, are, are pointing in the, in the same directions and uh, it's looking quite hopeful. 
Indeed, uh, and uh, one more time, thank you very much for, for implementing uh, this action. We're uh, looking forward to, to see uh, further its, uh, its results. Uh, I would like to uh, ask you to answer the same question in relation to the project PEM Wecho, if I pronounce it correctly. But before I give you the floor, I just wanted to mention that Senegal adopted a couple of years back a national strategic guidance document on green economy and subsequently uh, the National Green Job Strategy. Mm -hmm. So it's a very important document in relation to the topic that we're discussing today. But also very interestingly, these strategies focus, among many other things, on youth employment, on uh, entrepreneurs, on partnerships for green jobs creation and skills, as well as the promotion of innovation and research. So how all this fit in your project? I know that it's very complex. Also, you try to bring in uh, new actors. And uh, uh, at what phase and stage of implementation are you uh, right now? Just a couple of words on the project so you will be acquainted and it will be easier to understand. First, I'm very happy that we have an African, a wall of word to call this project, which is WECHO, which means uh, connecting in um, entreprendre. Help me with the English word. Um, doesn't come to my mind. Yeah, it's, it's the verb for entrepreneurship. So really what is at the basis, at the basics of any exchange among people who have ideas and need to set them in motion. And therefore the mobility there is really the basis for making business idea work across countries. The straight answer to your question is this project PEM Wecho, Project on Entrepreneurial Mobility, Wecho, Entreprendre, Échanger, Exchange, uh, having enterprises uh, and entrepreneurship at the core of the discussions between actors in, in Senegal and in Belgium, is really based on the willingness of Senegal itself to invest in the green transition, to invest skills, to invest in putting at the core of the Plan Sénégal Emergent, the National Development Plan for Senegal that is really putting the green, the skills, the investments, the innovation and the mobility at the core of what the country should look like in 10 years' time. As a development actor, this is the starting point. What the partner country really wants for itself and how, as a Belgian, actor, we can make sure that the diversity of actors that us as a platform, as a broker, as a development actor can put together, can find that famous area of common interest despite different missions, different goals, different starting point, in order to make sure not just that we are contributing to the development of Senegal, which would be a brilliant and wonderful plan, but I understand it cannot be the priority for an enterprise, for a union, for uh, a European minister, etc., but also to tap into the needs of the small and medium enterprises in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in Austria, in Germany, that are looking for talents, but that are also looking for solutions and that are looking for external markets because the big players have it easier to gain space in external markets, whereas for small players, it can be extremely challenging. So the starting point of this project, of these business models, as you said, is multiple, because I think that everything that we've been hearing today, and I look at my Belgian colleagues here, has multiple goals and multiple drives those who deal with migration management possibly cannot care less about the fact that there are shortages. Those that deal with labor market couldn't care less that it is difficult uh, to get a visa. They want their problem solved. What we are dealing with here is how to work at the interface of different and sometimes diverging mm -hmm. interest goals principle and make sure that when working at these interfaces, we address the green transition, the development principles for Senegal, the possibility for people to be on the move, the principle that um, 
make sure that the states take care of who enters and who doesn't enter and who stay in and who doesn't stay in their territories. So these are small projects, pilot projects, that can pave the way for bigger ideas if we look carefully of what we learn out of them in these interfaces. So thank you very much once again for having operators here because it's essential that we don't forget that matches don't happen in a void, don't, don't happen in the air. You need all this system and all this testing behind in order to get to a matching. Thank you very much. The discussion is getting more interesting and more passionate. However, we have only five minutes left, and I've been uh, asked by the organizers to, to finish on time to prepare the room for the next session. So now it's time for questions from the audience. If uh, you have anything to ask our panelists about their work on harnessing the potential of, the green, uh, of human mobility for the green transition. Please, uh, I think we have also a microphone. Yes, my colleague will uh, provide you with one. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, it's been very interesting discussions. I'm very pleased to hear about the business model that you're embarking upon. Um, African tech solutions are leapfrogging European solutions. Um, and for example, they're addressing uh, mobile health access to healthcare in Africa. So the question is, how could we pilot, bring some of these leading impact solutions and pilot them within the camps with people that don't have access to healthcare with a vision of accelerating those solutions to the local population? So, um, and how could we engage with you to, to enable that? Um, is what I'd like to ask, thank you. Immediate re reaction. Thank you very much. This is certainly one of the most difficult questions. No speaker would like to get. Them. <laughs> I'm joking. But um, the the health sector and access to health and access to care is uh, um, is the next level of complexity when talking about how human mobility and the nexus with other areas plays on the ground. So what I can tell from our experience from our concrete experience that doesn't apply yet to the health sector. Why? Because it's a highly regulated sector for which envisaging mobility is particularly complicated, although it is one of the sectors that is most in need, not just in Belgium and in Austria, wherever on earth. So um, it is one of the sectors where allowing mobility is the most requested by public and private actors and where it is the most complex to allow mobility. Therefore, your question is particularly relevant because one of the actions that enable as a development actor carries out, for instance, in countries like Uganda, when we work in the northern districts where there is an important amount of displaced and refugee people from South Sudan, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and other, is to work on the access to health by also requalifying or upskilling existing talent or qualified nurses, for instance, that live in the camps in such a way that they have the authorization to work in uh, health services that are both in settlements and out of settlements. So uh, I would be very interesting, interested to bilaterally keep this uh, conversation going because this business model, business model that for now is very much focusing on specific uh, situation can certainly be assessed and analyzed more broadly because the care sector is on demand everywhere and because talents are out there. Is there any other burning question that you can address? right now, otherwise you can continue interacting with our speakers during coffee breaks or uh, with tonight's dinner. Shall I agree? The, I see also a question on, on the screen, so maybe very, very quickly, and that could also serve as a conclusion. The green transition is envisaged as a just and inclusive process on paper. How can this be achieved in practice? And how can gender equality be guaranteed when it comes to skills investment? If you would like to give it a try, please, about the just and inclusive aspect of the transition. 
Yeah, well, I mean, of course, I mean, that's what we're trying in the Netherlands as well, to focus on beta studies and then focusing also on people who are not part of it. So addressing also this, this gender issue, both in the north as well as also in, in the global south. So trying to select students who are part of this circular migration program uh, should also address, and we do that, uh, address this issue of, of gender. Thank you. Um, so let me bring, unfortunately, to, to an end this uh, side event uh, by highlighting three things. So we spoke about policy systems partnerships. We also spoke about the importance of synergies between multiple policies that put skills, employment and migration at, at the heart of interventions. The second element that I try to capture from, from um, your uh, statements is pretty much linked to the ecosystem, diversity of, of partners. And in this respect, I think the green transition and um, human mobility as um, a factor to contribute to it would benefit from whole of society, I think you said it, whole of government, whole of business and actually whole of skills approach. And also uh, when it comes to your initiatives that you have uh, presented today, I think both of them, PEM, WECHO and uh, Mobilize are very promising and uh, feasible when it comes to uh, fostering the nexus between green and mobility. And I think also you mentioned very eloquently about the importance of lessons learned and inspire other actors to learn from your work. So I also st I'm strongly encouraging you to do so uh, because we're also very much looking forward to the results of uh, these two actions in the near future to draw more lessons and to see how we can further expand and innovate this type of interventions. And this being said, yes, unfortunately, now I have to uh, bring the session to an end. Thank you very much for your interest, for your uh, participation. And let me thank one more time, Rafaela and Dr. Debour for your uh, participation and for sharing with us what you know about this fascinating thank topic. You. Thank you very much. All right, thanks.